Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the uh, plenary session uh, today on Thursday, uh, July 22nd. Um, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, depending where from where you're connecting. So uh, today in our plenary session, uh, we have uh, two uh, talks from two very distinguished uh, 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 scientists. Uh, Professor Michael Mikkelsen from Duke University and Professor Nader Engleta from University of Pennsylvania. Uh, so uh, the first presentation is recorded, uh, but Michael is uh, here to answer your questions. Uh, we are looking uh, for about uh, 30 to 33 minutes presentation and two, three minutes, um, around two, three minutes for uh, questions and answers. Uh, so uh, the title of uh, Mikan's talk is Applications of Metasurfaces for Multispectral Imaging to Optical Communications and Biosensing. Uh, Piotr, uh, can you run the presentation? Hello, uh, I'm Megan Mickelson from Duke University, uh, and I'm delighted uh, to give this uh, plenary talk and would like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity and um, organizing this conference uh, first in the hybrid and now the fully virtual format. So I'm excited to tell you about uh, some applications of meter surfaces, in particular uh, experiments that we've been doing in my lab uh, at Duke. Uh, from multispectral imaging to optical communications and biosensing. So I think it's very exciting how the field of meter surfaces is maturing and how we can see it evolving from proof of contact demonstrations and starting to move into applications and um, how wide range uh, of areas that meter surfaces could have a potential impact in applications in. So here's some examples from uh, review papers of meter surfaces uh, and some of the early experiments we saw negative refraction and enhanced uh, radiation of quantum emitters integrated into meter surfaces. And now we're starting to see examples of nonlinear and quantum meter surfaces, which is very exciting uh, in this recent review paper um, in Nature Photonics. Examples of um, the meter surface has indeed moved into uh, uh, applications as a meter surfaces for lenses. So this is a field that's very exciting and rapidly maturing of how to um, uh, make these typically all dielectric meter surfaces to um, perform different um, uh, operations and, and uh, uh, lenses here. Uh, for flat optics at uh, various wavelengths in a nice review by uh, Frederico Capasso and uh, collaborators here. So what I would like to tell you about is a few examples of uh, potential applications um, for some of my research uh, at Duke, and this is also in, in a wide range of areas. So, um, my research is really motivated by uh, utilizing what you can almost call atomic scale photonics, molecular scale photonics, where we are taking advantage of very small gap between materials uh, to force material properties and light matter interactions to be very distinct from the bulk uh, counterparts. And then integrating solid state and biomaterials and utilizing also fast experimental techniques to uh, probe these emerging phenomena. And this approach allows us to reveal uh, what you could refer to as hybrid materials with very specifically tailored optical properties. So the examples I will give you here today in this talk is um, from optoelectronics, how uh, we can utilize meter surfaces to move towards making multispectral photodetectors and move towards multispectral imaging. I'll also give you an example here of how we can utilize meter surfaces 
uh, to potentially have an impact for optical communications. We did that actually in a collaboration with industry, uh, with um, the connectivity lab at Facebook, where we could potentially use meter surfaces just both to make fast um, uh, sources and receivers for optical communications. And finally, an, an uh, example in the biomedical field, uh, how um, meter surfaces could be a game changer for uh, certain um, types of point of care diagnostics. So I'm very excited about um, the rich possibilities for meter surfaces to, to make an impact uh, in our world. Let's start with the um, multispectral detectors. So um, there's a lot of challenges in this area. And generally, if you want to make a detector or wide spectral range, if you can do a thermal detector, that would be ideal. So you don't have to deal with multiple detectors to span a broad wavelength range. Uh, there's nice examples in literature already here um, from um, uh, Dirk England's group here, the uh, graphene uh, bolometer um, that also shows uh, potential for fast response times. This is uh, mainly done at cryogenic temperatures and requires uh, very careful um, nanofabrication, as, as you can see here. Another a nice example from uh, Harry Atwater's group, uh, where they're demonstrating a fast thermoelectric and spectrally selective uh, photodetector. Um, uh, here with these um, uh, legs going in. And then there's some examples too with the pyroelectric, uh, which allows for very um, easy nanofabrication, straightforward nanofabrication and room temperature operation. But these typically slow, show very slow response times, um, in this case, around 100 milliseconds. So that's a big drawback. So ideally, what we're looking for is something that could be spectrally selective, that could be fast, that could operate at room temperature, and that would allow us for a relatively easy nanofabrication. Uh, so we're actually picking sort of the one that looks most challenging uh, from at least a time perspective uh, here, the pyroelectrics, uh, because this allows very easy integration with the meter surfaces that we worked with uh, in the past. Uh, so pyroelectrics are not quite as famous as the cousins, the ferroelectrics and piezoelectrics, uh, but ferroelectrics that generate a current in response to a temperature change. So they have basically a temperature dependent spontaneous polarization. Uh, so it's illustrated here. So you can see if you don't have any temperature change, the crystal has a certain orientation. And then once you have a small temperature change, um, and the crystal orientation of the polarization is changing slightly. It gives us rise to this uh, current, which is proportional to that temperature change. And as I mentioned, it's in the same family as ferroelectric and piezoelectrics, where you can change uh, their spontaneous uh, their polarization with either um, pressure, strain, or, or an electrical uh, bias. And in this case, then we just change the polarization in the crystal by heat. And since we are generating heat, uh, the um, metal plasmonics, this is actually a very well suited material because when light is shining on our structure, that light is generating uh, heat in the middle, then it then allows us to convert it to, to current. So it allows us sort of the direct uh, correspondence between the amount of light that's absorbed in our meter surfaces and the current here. And next, uh, we wanted to integrate uh, a meter surface, of course. And the meter surfaces that we worked on a lot in my group, and that's very well suited uh, for this particular case as well, um, are these uh, nano gap um, plasmonic structures, uh, nano pads, antennas, um, we call them as well. So they consist of a gold film around 50 nanometers. Then we have a um, polymer dielectric spacer laser here. Uh, about uh, one to seven, sometimes up to around 10 nanometers. And then we use uh, nanoparticles, the colloidal nanocubes, as shown in this case, and later on also um, EBL fabricated nanoparticles. Um, and this, um, um, we can then cover uh, large surfaces with, and this uh, structure act as a perfect absorber 
at a particular wavelength at the plasmon resonance. And what we can do and, and showed in this case is that we can pattern the areas that's covered with metasurfaces here into pixels. So that each of these pixels act as a, a spectral filter or as a, as a detector that's sensitive to a particular wavelength of light. And one thing um, that might not be obvious right away, but that's actually a bit challenging with this is that um, it requires um, precision in the vertical direction of a single nanometer scale. Um, but we want to be able to do this over centimeter scale areas or wafer scale areas. So it's really a, what we call multi-scale fabrication challenge. Um, so the way that we do it is using photolithography over the last areas, and then we're using either atomic layer deposition, um, layer by layer deposition of these polymers, um, which is techniques that can give us this single nanometer precision in the vertical direction. So it allows us to, to achieve uh, this required multi-scale uh, fabrication um, um, to, to demonstrate this. And here at the bottom, you can see uh, the plasma and resonance corresponding to this at uh, six different um, wavelength filters. In these experiments we published here, uh, we didn't have integrated the detector yet, but this is demonstrating sort of our pathway towards that. Um, the next step was then indeed to integrate our pyroelectrics or our detector material to the meter surface. And in this case, we just deposit the meter surfaces directly on top of this pyroelectric material. And in this case, our pyroelectric material is this aluminum nitride. And then our meter surface act both as a spectral filter and also um, to increase the absorption. So as a almost perfect absorber. Uh, so since we wanna detect light, the more light we can absorb, the better. Uh, below here is shown um, simple uh, COMSOL simulations of light hitting the structure. And we can see uh, quickly this um, generates a temperature change first in the gap region here, and then it's penetrating and uh, diffusing into the underlying layers. So we have gold here, and then down here we have our aluminum nitride pyroelectric, and we can see here it's modifying the polarization. And that modification in the polarization is then giving rise to uh, the pyroelectric voltage here. And this depends on the resistance of our structure, the detector area, the pyroelectric coefficient of the specific material uh, that we're using, and then our temperature chains. The next thing we wanted to check uh, is uh, that this photovoltaic indeed follows uh, our meter surface or unship spectral filters. And so does, does the fact that we put on the meter surface actually provide uh, a spectrally selective detection. Um, so here uh, in the top, uh, you see the reflectance. So this is showing the plasmon resonance of uh, three different structures here, with 100 nanometer cubes, 125 nanometer cubes, and 135 nanometer cubes. And below here, you see the responsivity um, or uh, photo voltage. Um, that's measured here um, uh, for the three different detectors. And we can see that the peak value here uh, matches exactly with the plasma resonance. So this is indicating that we can indeed um, achieve spectrally selective detection and that these um, plasma um, made of surfaces indeed uh, create uh, spectrally selective detections. Uh, on the right here, um, we also wanted to demonstrate that uh, this can really be done at any wavelength. So uh, because of the time, we didn't have nanocubes uh, that were this last that could give us resonances um, beyond like um, a thousand nanometers, then we fabricated structures with um, uh, gold patches, basically, as you see here, using electron beam lithography, so a standard uh, nanofabrication technique. And we can see, indeed, we can get the responsivity uh, to follow that plasma resonance as well out here. 
you might notice that the responsivity is lower here. This is simply a function of the area of the EVL surface being smaller than the area of the colloid emitter surface or, or the detector area. Uh, and as we know, the responsivity then depends on that detector area. But it shows that this technique and this um, setup indeed uh, is, is very wavelength independent. And the experiment so far shows that the photovoltaic follows the absorption of the plasma and resonance. Um, and it demonstrates the spectrally selective detection from 660 nanometers up to about two microns. Uh, so, um, so we're pretty excited about that. Another thing that we're also really excited about and that was a little bit more of a surprise is that we actually uh, discovered that um, there's an ultra fast detection speed here, that the detection response is much faster than is typically seen. Um, the um, pyroelectric detectors and also more broadly the spectrally selective thermal detectors. So what's happening here and what you're looking at is uh, we are hitting our structure with a femtosecond pulse, so kilohertz laser, laser in this case, and then we are measuring the photovoltaics as a function of time afterwards uh, so to see the response. And uh, the way that these um, detectors are typically uh, characterized, the speed is a 10 to 90% rise time. So uh, how quickly is this initial rise? And you can see this is pretty fast in this case, around 700 uh, picoseconds. And then we can see uh, after a while, then we see some, uh, some cooling. So it depolarizes. We see a few oscillations here, which are mainly due to vibrations. Um, in this setup. So this initial fast time um, and also the full bit half max to some extent, those sort of the important parameters to, to look at here. Um, and it's also important to note that our readout is actually limited to around 500 megahertz um, due to um, micro manipulators and, and oscilloscopes and things that are used. And the simulations that we show and think here actually convolve with the instrument response uh, that takes into account the slow readout that we have, which is not limited uh, by our nanoscale detector itself. Uh, but despite these limitations, we already see a five orders of magnitude faster response than previous spectrally selected thermal detectors. And here I'm not limiting us to just pyroelectric detectors. This is any like spectrally selected uh, thermal detectors that we uh, we have seen in literature. Another uh, quick thing to test uh, that's that's useful is to see uh, how the speed depends on the detector size, uh, because this um, detector can be considered as sort of a basic parallel plate capacitor where the bandwidth is one over RC, um, which means it depends inversely on the area of the detector. So the last of the detectors, the slower it should be. So here we made detectors of various sizes and repeated these experiments. And we can see they do indeed get slower as the detectors are getting bigger. Uh, we can plot this here as detector size versus the time. And we can see it pretty much follows this RC limited response uh, that we expect. Um, and we can also sort of find um, the interesting uh, size is around 75 microns. That's around where it's limited by the RC time constants. And once we get below that, then we don't really know what's limiting it at that point. Um, so that's something that's very interesting to explore to see how fast could it be and what other uh, types of limitations uh, come into play at that point. And next, um, something that um, is, is interesting and potential applications for this uh, um, these super pixels that you can make for, uh, for hyperspectral imaging. Um, where you, um, so hyperspectral imaging, you basically need to collect the broad wavelength range around typically about 400 to 2,500 nanometers for each uh, image, for each pixel in an image, uh, which means each pixel here, you can have this reflectance uh, spectrum. And um, that allows you to tell tell you a lot about uh, the material and uh, 
a composition, that material that you're looking at, it's often referred to as a spectral fingerprint. And uh, so we can go back and, and look at these pixel structure that I showed before and see how now you could imagine that you could have detectors under each of these and actually make multi spectral imaging or hyperspectral imaging, which is really important for a lot of technological applications, uh, such as uh, mapping props, uh, which is referred to as precision agriculture and is actually a huge, huge industry. It's also widely used for food and water safety monitoring. Um, in this case, you can see using hyperspectral imaging, you can identify contaminated chicken. And it's also used for, um, to detect cancer tissue and image guided surgery. In this image, uh, using hyperspectral imaging, you can identify areas uh, where the tumor is present and where you have normal tissue. And it's also to used in computer vision for automated systems. So it has a wide range of applications. And typically, um, uh, people are using external scanning systems. So if we can actually have these spectral filters directly on chip, that could uh, be a game changer in the field. Uh, so I hope I convinced you that uh, meta surfaces could have an impact and could be have very interesting applications in up to electronics and in particular for multispectral photo detectors. Um, it could also, uh, the next example is for in the realm of, of quantum science and optical communications. Here we had a collaboration with uh, the connectivity lab at Facebook. They were very interested in uh, basically bringing the internet to remote parts uh, of the world and doing uh, free space optical communications potentially um, from um, satellites or drones where they needed large areas detectors because you have this light that's um, diverging. So, and that could detect light fast and of course also for optical communications. We're also always interested in, um, in fast light sources. Uh, but it's, um, for both of these cases, um, they were very interested in seeing how large area could we go. And you might be familiar with some of my earlier work where I showed uh, how we can do fast single photon sources and we can study a single nano cavities and single cubes very well. So this was sort of the opposite challenge is that how large can you go? How uniform can, can you be? Um, what's the limit there? So first to be able to get a lot of light out and a high conversion efficiency, which was something else that they've cared a lot about because we don't want to lose a lot of information. So when we have some light coming in, we want um, a fair amount of that light still coming out. So in this case, we packed our structure with multiple layers of um, a, a bright dye. Here we used that of 532. And uh, we put uh, the cubes on here, a little bit denser than typical. And then we made lots <coughs> lots areas here. And uh, the pink here uh, shows the area on our chip that's covered uh, by nanocubes, in this case, about 12 millimeter diameter. And at a first look, what we see is that the fluorescence from the dye that's embedded in the cavity is much brighter than the dye in the glass. Uh, so we already see this large uniform fluorescence enhancement. And what's critical for this is that we, of course, pick our plasmon resonance wisely. Uh, so what we did in this case was also picking a dye that had a small stock shift, so small shift between its absorption and emission peak. And then we had a plasmon resonance to sort of overlap both of them to be able to enhance uh, both the absorption by excitation rate as well as the emission. And what we see in the fluorescence is um, a bright enhancement in the fluorescence here. Um, to be able to see any peak in this graph, we ended up using a higher excitation power down here than here. So this is actually corresponding to almost a thousand fold enhancement in the fluorescence. And what's unique for, for this experiment compared to what we've done before is that this is really truly from large area structures. Uh, you're not cherry picking a nano antenna that's performing well. This is an average result of a large area surface. Um, and I think that's really important uh, when we start to think about using meta surfaces for variety applications where uh, you're not able to do that 
uh, cherry picking and where you need to have a surface with a large uniform response, uh, which is also important in, for example, uh, nano biosensing uh, applications. Uh, so here we have almost a thousand fold enhancement in the fluorescence. This corresponds in our case to a photon conversion to of uh, around 30%, uh, which we are quite, quite happy about. And then um, I'll show in the next graph that we have an emission rate enhancement around 130 fold. Um, and here we are mainly just uh, getting into the limit of our instrument response. The other thing that's really important for optical communications is that we can actually modulate the signal, right? Because you're imagining you, that each of these light pulses is transferring pieces of information, so you want to be able to, to modulate this quickly. Um, so what we did to test that out was to have a pump pulse here, and then another uh, probe pulse arriving at a later time. So we had our pulse days, and we just split it into two. So we just have two pulses at the same wavelength. And then uh, what you see in red, or in the color here, is the shape of those uh, two pulses. And what you see in the, oh, sorry, the other way around, what you see in the dashed line is the shape of those two pulses. And what you see in the color line is how our fluorescence uh, follows um, those two laser pulses. And we can see that the two follow it very closely here. Um, uh, so that gives us uh, an ultrafast response at uh, greater than 20 uh, gigahertz and also the decent uh, dB uh, uh, discrimination between these two uh, pulses. Um, and this is another example, uh, uh, sort of zoomed in here, where you can see how fast this response is, about only 12 picoseconds. Um, and uh, some of you might be familiar with my work where we are claiming instead of 130-fold enhancement in, in uh, emission rates, 1,000-fold, and this all depends on just how fast is the dye to begin with. So this was a relatively fast dye, so the lifetime was only about an, a nanosecond and a half. In some cases, we had um, uh, controls that had a 10 nanosecond um, uh, lifetime. So that's really where the difference comes from, because the 12 picosecond is really right up against our IRF. This is our instrument response function of our setup. Another interesting thing with these experiments is that uh, the structure could also act as an atadine uh, reducer, meaning that it can absorb light from broad angles and emit it into a narrow cone. This is something that's maybe a little bit of an unusual uh, application, but something that could be important for fast. Uh, receivers for optical communication, where you want to be able to detect a lot of light coming from a broad angle, and then you want to maybe refocus it into a standard fast for the diet. So this is indicating how it's absorbing over a broader angle and then emitting into a narrow cone. Um, so I think it's exciting, again, to see metasurfaces surfaces uh, having potential impact in such a uh, wide variety of fields. And finally, I'm going to jump to yet another field, which is uh, biomedical uh, engineering and kind of care uh, diagnostics uh, in particular. So there's a great desire for um, point of care detection. So typically approaches, uh, if you have some concerns, you go to the doctor, they do a blood test, they send it to the lab. Um, and the lab has some expensive equipment that it takes them uh, a little while to run, if, um, a day or more. And this is not suitable for limited resource settings, since this is typically expensive, requires a lot of infrastructure to, to set up the shipments of, of your samples. And it's also not suitable for in-home monitoring of disease and treatments. Uh, whereas, of course, point of care detection has a number of advantages because you would only need a finger stick of blood, it's port portable and single step, and uh, ideally it should be affordable with an in inexpensive readout technique. And in particular, this inexpensive readout technique is an area where uh, plasmonics can help, in particular for fluorescence based biosensors. Uh, so the idea here could be that we could boost the signal so much that you could use a very inexpensive readout machine instead of these very expensive um, readout detectors in the in laboratories. 
So there's a number of nice examples in, in, in literature here, one showing a plasmonic stamp on top of an essay here um, that's showing around 100-fold enhancements that can simply be stamped on top of of uh, an essay, so it has these small rods. Um, there's also an example here uh, uh, with rough gold films that's also providing uh, enhancements. Uh, both, around, both examples provides around 100 fold enhancement in the fluorescence, um, but the essays require multiple steps and are not compatible with point of cat tests. Uh, and these uh, could sort of be considered sort of a, a, a first generation plasmonic structures that are relatively simple. Uh, whereas nanogap structures is expected to provide lots of fluorescence enhancement, as has been shown in sort of proof of concept um, experiments in the past. Uh, so in the past, we have shown with these nanogap structures that we could see up to about 30-fold fluorescence enhancement. So what we did in this experiment was varying the plasmon resonance, and we can see when the plasmon resonance is close to the excitation wavelengths, we saw up to 30,000-fold enhancement in the fluorescence, uh, which was mainly due to an enhanced absorption and some smaller contributions from improved quantum yield and improved collection efficiency. Um, our challenge was then to see how could we integrate this with an immunoassay or some biosensor. Uh, so in this case, we collaborated with Ashutosh Chikolte, um, faculty at the Biomedical Engineering at the department at Duke, has a well-developed amino acid that's already um, um, also uh, developed in, in industry and the companies. So this is uh, really performed sort of state-of-the-art immunoassays. Um, so we want to integrate that uh, with our um, plasmonic platform. So our ambitious goal was to put this whole essay inside our meta surface, to, because this is the little area in this gap where we're enhancing the fluorescence the most. Uh, so this looks a little ambitious, but it actually does work. So uh, what we had to do was then um, grow our PROECMA, our immunoassay on gold instead of the standard um, glass substrate. Um, and then we had to add the cubes on top. And already from our first experiments, we saw last enhancements in the fluorescence from these assays compared to the assays uh, on the standard glass substrates. The way that uh, we characterize this properly is to look at the fluorescence intensity as we vary the uh, concentration of a biomarker. And in this case, we picked a cardiac biomarker that's called BNP. And we measured um, the fluorescence intensity both on a glass control shown in black and also on the gold substrate before the cubes are added, which is shown in green and then after the cubes are added. Uh, so it's that we have the full nanogap structure. And what we see here is around a 200-fold enhancement in fluorescence. And this is in this dynamic uh, range, which is a clinically relevant regime. Uh, so that's very encouraging. Um, one question might be, um, is this enough uh, to make a difference? Uh, and so to, in order to test that, we tried to see, can we actually use a cheaper camera? Because as you recall, that's what I said was very important for point of care diagnostics. As in this case, we got this uh, $35 uh, webcam, uh, just a little bit bigger than a quarter seen here, and also a cheap laser diet. And what we see is when we have various concentrations of our biomarker here in our nano gap cavity, we're starting to see signal here um, this is fluorescence images of the whole essay. And we then integrate over all that, and that's transferred into these points for each uh, concentration. So we can see we have signal here for our nanogap cavities, but there's no signal for the glass control, even at the highest intensities, the highest concentrations. Uh, so that's showing that um, even with a relatively modern enhancement in fluorescence of 200 fold, it can start to make a difference to move us much closer to point of care diagnostics. And one other thing you might have noticed is that we had um, some relatively large error bars, which is likely due to non-specific binding here. And also it's not ideal, these cubes require a separate adhesion layer, so that's obviously not user-friendly. 
Uh, so instead, what we did was um, in the second generation of experiments, we're supposed to conjugate these cubes directly to an antibody and then repeat the experiments. And what we see is an improvement in the limit of detection, a reduction of the nonspecific binding, and also a reduction of the assay steps. Uh, so we're very excited about uh, the prospects of, of moving this to uh, the biomedical field and, and having an impact off meter surfaces on point of care diagnostics. Uh, I would want to make sure to acknowledge my wonderful group at Duke, my collaborators, my funding agencies. Um, and then um, we put the summary here. So we show this fast thermal detection, also fast emission over centimeter scale areas. And I discussed this plasmonic enhanced biosensor. And then I also want to draw your attention to a couple of recent reviews that we wrote, uh, one in Nature Materials and one in ACS Photonics. So thank you so much for your attention and I would be happy to take questions. Uh, thank you very much, Maiken, for the excellent talk, very exciting results. Uh, so we have time for a few questions. Um, I start from the Q&A uh, section. There is a question posted. Um, um, I read the question. Uh, from the SEM images, it seems that the nanocubes have been dispersed quite uniformly and the distance between two neighboring nanocubes is large. Uh, which technique did you use uh, to disperse these nanoparticles? Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, so these are drop casted and then they're placed under a cover slip for about half an hour and then they're naturally dispersing. Uh, so the nanocubes are covered in a polymer that's P PVP uh, that's um, slightly charred. So they're slightly uh, repelling each other, which is causing this uh, uniform distance between them, which is around 200 nanometers. Uh, an alternative way of making this is also uh, with EBL, um, and, and we tried that and that works as well. But of course it doesn't have the large area benefit of the nanocubes. Thank you very much. And I have actually a question related to this. Maybe I should ask it here. Um, if you, uh, when you build uh, the uh, hyperspectral imaging systems that you have multiple pixels that have different cube sizes, uh, do you do the fabrication in parallel or in series one by one? Because you have to selectively place the nanocubes, right? Yeah, so in that case, we did it um, 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 in series one at a time, each of the colors one at a time. Uh, so we did have another paper showing in advanced materials that we can also do it the combinatorial colors because of course like that doesn't scale as well so we also try to do one that's like has red green and blue, blue channels and then you can just vary in intensity of each of these channels and show about 10,000 combinatorial colors we published that in advanced materials but we haven't tried to integrate that combinatorial color scheme uh, with the detection mechanism uh, at this point um, um, so yeah it is a bit of a limitation but it depends on how many um, 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 pixels you need, uh, and you can find ways around that, yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, we have another uh, question here posted. Uh, to what extent is the response of the biosensor linear with analyte concentrator? Uh, that was difficult to read from uh, the log scale graph. Yeah, so it has a linear uh, response. So it has sort of the expected response that we see without a plasmonic structure. Uh, we just enhance it. So um, uh, it has a linear dy dynamic range and then it has uh, where it's curving off. Um, so it has the expected shape, but it is uh, increased. Yeah. Thank you very much. Are there any other questions? Uh... But we are running into sometimes problems with the gain that it's saturating the detectors and things um, because it's very different scales that we're working at with the plasmonic enhancement and without it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And we're working also in improving the uniformity. You could see the enhancement, but not quite as high as we saw uh, without the plasmonic sensor. And that's some non uniformity of the polymer brush that we're working on and making more uniform because the roughness of the film underneath um, is very. Uh, very important. So having that uniform is important to have high enhancement. Thank you very much. 
So I see no other question posted. Maybe I can ask one more question. Uh, so uh, for the spectrally selective or sensitive uh, photo detectors, uh, you showed results up to two micrometer wavelength. Uh, are there any challenges for scaling it uh, up in uh, to uh, longer wavelengths? Is it that the size of these nanoparticles get large to manage? Um, not really. I mean, we were just not set up to do it at the time. So now we're building up and have lasers and detectors at those wavelengths. So we're trying to work at longer wavelengths. It's generally easier to make, make larger particles than you can use photolithography even, or you can uh, use EBL. Uh, to do that, uh, finding chemistry to make uh, these nan colloidal nanoparticles at all these different sizes can take quite a bit of optimization to, to target different sizes. Uh, I think we've gone up to about 250 nanometers now, but um, that's a bit time consuming, uh, but it's uh, relatively easy to test out for the EBL or even for the lithography. But we will see, there might be some unexpected challenges. Right. Well, thank you so much for the excellent presentation. Uh, I thank you for your time. So uh, we now move to our uh, second planning.